This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Lent is a time of charity, and there are many forms of charity. We often think of giving alms to the poor as a principal form of charity, and for good reason. Our Lord rather heavily emphasized care for the poor and how he has a preference for the poor in many ways. The poor you will always have with you. Sometimes people mistaken what he means by the poor as purely being poor in a material sense. And while that is absolutely something that's very important in the faith and caring for those who have materially less than the rest of us, spiritual poverty is also something we should take very seriously. But charity is an interesting topic. We sometimes hear people talk about being charitable, how offering criticism isn't being charitable. You have to have the most charitable interpretation of every single thing certain people say. It gets tiresome after a while because it's sort of a distorted sense of charity. So today, on this Sunday in Lent, I hope we re can return now to Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, one of the great minds of the 20th century, one of the last great theologians in the hierarchy before the council. And here's going to tell us and teach us about fraternal charity. I have given them the glory you gave to me, that they may be one as we are one. See John chapter 17, verse 22. When our soul is purified by mortification and renunciation, the supernatural light that is given us in prayer increases the love of God in us and permits us to accomplish in a manner more and more perfect the first precept of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul and with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But there is a second precept which derives necessarily from the first. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Love of neighbor is presented to us by our Lord as a necessary consequence and sign of our love of God. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this you have one another, for everyone will know that you are my disciples. St. John has written, anyone who says I love God and hates his brother is a liar. One day our Lord wanted to make blessed Henry Susso, who had asked to be shown a truly perfect man, understand this truth. Blessed Henry had this vision. In the middle of a vast plain, he saw a cross, and at its foot a man of meek aspect, and with a kind and gentle look. A little bit farther on, there was two groups of men, very different among themselves, who were trying in vain to reach him. This man represented Christ, and all those who have attained a union with Christ, characterizing themselves by their mildness and gentleness. One of the two groups represented the intellectuals who contemplate and admire the truth, but do not put into practice as perfection demands. The other group represented all these men who give themselves to all the practices taught by the authors on spirituality and of the greatest mortifications. None of the two groups could reach Christ, and for the same reason, those who pass their life in contemplation, or rather in speculation, without putting these truths into practice, judged and condemned others without mercy, and while those who made a profession of mortification condemned without mercy those who did not follow their way. These religious did not reach Christ because they did not love one another, and their lack of charity showed itself in the harshness of their judgment. Henry Susso gave thanks for the lesson, and, though well advanced into perfection, beat his breast for having lacked fraternal charity and having severely judged his confreres. We ought to meditate on this great obligation of charity toward our neighbor. If we are lacking in it so many times, or permit ourselves to develop an excess affection other than that demanded of us by the Lord, it is because we do not understand in a practical way that fraternal charity is nothing other than the extension of the love that we ought to have for God. This love, essentially supernatural and theological, must extend to all our brothers. Therefore, we should consider what the love of God ought to extend to our neighbor and how to practice fraternal charity. We must recognize that our nature leads us to love those who do us good and to hate those who do us evil, while leaving us indifferent toward the others. Before the coming of Christ, the Pharisees taught, you must love your neighbor, but they added, hate your enemy. Our Lord says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In this way, you will be sons of our fathers in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on bad men as well as good and his reign to fall on honest and dishonest men alike. For if you love those who love you, what right have you to claim any credit? Even the tax collectors do as much, do they not? And if you save your greeting for your brothers, are you doing anything exceptional? Even the pagans do as much, do they not? You must therefore be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. 
The fraternal charity demanded of us does not belong to the natural order like the fraternity that can exist between pagans. Rather, it is essentially of the supernatural order. Natural love makes us love our neighbor for the benefits that we have received from him or for his good qualities. Charity, on the other hand, makes us love our neighbor for God, because he is a son of God or is called to become one. Is it possible for us to love men with the same love with which we love God, even with the same divine love? The strictest, strictest theology responds with yes, and explains this to us with a very simple example. He who deeply loves a friend also loves the sons because he loves their father, and he loves the sons with a true love, which in case of need, he also tries to demonstrate. Therefore, if all men are sons of God, or at least called to become so, we ought to love them all, and love them in the measure that we love our common father. To love our neighbor in a supernatural way, it is sufficient to look at him with the eyes of faith and to remember that, though he differs from us in condition and character, he is still born, like us, not only of flesh, of blood, and of the will of man, but of God. Or at least he is called to be born to the life of God, to participate in the divine nature and eternal beatitude. Hence, both of us belong to the same family of God. How then can I not love him if I truly love God? But if I do not love him, yet pretend to love God, I certainly am lying. If, on the other hand, I love him with this love, it is a sign that I love God, since the love of God is the same love that is directed to the true supernatural reality of my neighbor. In other words, I love him because he is a son of God and a member of the mystical body of Christ, because the Holy Spirit dwells or wishes to dwell in him. I love him because he is destined to become, like me, a living stone of the heavenly Jerusalem, and perhaps a more precious and better worked stone. I love him in him the realization of the divine idea that rules his destiny, and I can love him with a divine love because I love him for the glory that will eternally give to God. Sometimes the worldly will object, but does this really mean loving man? Is this not rather loving only God and Christ in him? Man ought to be loved for himself. First of all, it might be mentioned that man as man cannot claim the right to a divine love. In reality, however, charity does not only love God in man, but also man in God, and for God because it loves what man ought to become, namely an eternal part of the mystical body of Christ. Moreover, charity does all in its power so that man may be able to attain his true destiny. Also, it loves what he already is through grace. If he does not have grace, charity loves his nature, not insofar as it is hostile to grace in consequence of original sin, but insofar as it is capable of receiving grace. Charity loves man in himself with the same love with which it loves God. Ultimately, it loves him for God, for the glory he is called to give him. If this is so, it follows that we ought to love all men. All are, in fact, neighbors similar to ourselves, because all are created in the image of God and called to be part of his family, and enjoy the same glory. Therefore, it is clear that we ought to love those also who are naturally indifferent to us, and even our enemies, because they do not cease, by this reason, from being sons of God, or at least called to be such. Moreover, we ought to be disposed to help our enemies, at least if we should see them in a situation where they are reduced to a condition of extreme necessity and an urgent need of our help. This is a precept. When it is not a case of extreme need, our Lord counsels us to help them. Our charity should not know limits. It cannot exclude anyone on earth, in purgatory, or in heaven. It stops only before hell. In fact, only the damned cannot be loved beat by charity because they no longer have the capacity of becoming sons of God, and since they hate him eternally and have neither the capacity nor the desire to be lifted up, they can no longer draw our compassion. Except for the unquestionable case of the condemned, we ought to exercise our charity toward all, because charity knows no other limits than those of the very love in the heart of God. We ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, that is, not for self-interest or pleasure, but desiring for him as for ourselves grace and glory, which will be the glory of God. We should not, however, love him more than ourselves. We must prefer our own salvation to that of others. We cannot put ourselves at a distance from God to save our neighbor, although we may die for his salvation. Indeed, sometimes we have the obligation to do so, as when he is entrusted to us. Charity, far from destroying natural love, raises it to the infinite, since it respects the natural order as it came from the hands of God. First of all, we ought to love God above every other thing, then our souls, then our neighbor, and lastly, our body. God wishes to reign in our heart, but he does not intend thereby to exclude all other affection that can be subordinated to what is given to him. On the contrary, he elevates it, making it grow daily in proportion to our progress and charity.
This fraternal charity should be the like of the love of God, not only effective, but effective. It is enough to remember the example of the saints. St. Dominic sold his books to feed the poor and wished to sell himself as a servant to ransom a prisoner. The lives of the saints, like that of our Lord, were a continual act of fraternal charity. Like their master, they loved their brother even to the cross, even to martyrdom. They took the saying of the Lord literally, Love one another as I have loved you. To announce the gospel to their brothers, they faced the worst sufferings. The occasions that could tempt us to be lacking in fraternal charity are always present, even in a monastery or convent. The souls that one must live with are certainly chosen souls, but only to a certain point. Whenever persons see each other from a morning to night throughout the years, in the most varied states of mind and conditions, in sickness and in health, in pain and in joy, one cannot help but notice that together with his many virtues, his confreres also carry some true moral infirmities. A monastery is not yet heaven. It is only the novitiate of heaven, a school of perfection. Even if all the defects would disappear, the occasions for bruises and little conflicts would still exist because of the diversity of feeling, character, education, and because of the nervous tension that derives from such an intense life. They would exist also by reason of the fact that while our Lord seeks to unite, the devil seeks to divide. Providence intentionally permits the existence of many occasions, so that we may humble ourselves and practice fraternal charity. It is in weakness that virtue is made perfect. Our own miserable humble, miseries humble us. Those of our neighbors make us practice virtue. Only in heaven will the causes of discord completely disappear, because there all the blessed will see God, in his beatific light, what they should desire and do. Here below, even the saints sometimes can be found disagreeing and inexplicably defending their own opposite points of view, with the conviction that it is a question of the will of God. It so happened with St. Philip Neri and St. Charles Borromeo that they could not agree concerning the orations of Milan. Thus, one had to recall his orations to Rome, while the others instituted the Oblates of Mary at Milan. In the midst of such difficulties, as well as ever-recurring new ones, how can one practice fraternal charity? Two things are necessary. To look upon one's neighbor with the eyes of faith, that is, to discover in him the supernatural being that we ought to love, and to love him by bearing with him, making ourselves useful and asking God for the union of hearts. First of all, we must look at our neighbor with the eyes of faith. Just as the love of God is born from faith in him, so it is with charity toward our neighbor. It is necessary, therefore, to look at our neighbor with the gaze of faith in order to discover in him that supernatural reality which we ought to love. Since that which is divine in him is sometimes deeply hidden from our view, not by faults that are grave in the eyes of God, but by defects of temperament that irritate us and that subsist despite virtue. In order to see the divine in him, we must have a pure and attentive eye. We will see it if we deserve to see it. Just as the living water of prayer is not given except after the purification of renunciation, in the same way it is not granted us to see God in souls until we have become detached from ourselves, this is so, not only that we may see the beauty of a soul despite the differences of character, but also that we may simply be able to think to ourselves every time we come in contact with another. This is a soul loved by God, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. He or she is a member of the mystical body of Christ, called with me to the same beatitude, and perhaps to a level higher than mine. This treats of a very simple thought, and yet what our Lord wants of us is found here. Jesus does not expect us to deceive ourselves in judging our neighbor. In fact, it is only supernatural benevolence that will enable us to see everything correctly. Rash judgment is, however, all too often set in opposition to this way of acting. The most frequent reproach that our Lord directs toward us for lack of charity to our neighbor is concerned explicitly with rash judgment. Do not judge. Rash judgment is essentially evil-minded. It is the decision of a judge who attributes to himself a jurisdiction that he does not have over the soul of his brothers. It is the verdict of a bribed judge, implacable without mercy, who knows only how to condemn. We see a slight indication of evil, and immediately we affirm that evil exists in an evident way. We see two and affirm four. All this stems from egoism and pride. Let it be noted further that if it is a question of grave matter, we commit a mortal sin. Our Lord is very severe in dealing with those who form rash judgments because they commit a double fault, against justice and against charity. They attribute to themselves a jurisdiction which they do not possess. In order to judge, one should possess the testimony of a trial, but when it is a question of judging the interior intentions of our neighbor, we cannot have the testimony of a trial. In this case, the only judge is God, who sees in the intimate part of the conscience, speaks to it, knows its ignorance, its errors, its difficulties, its temptations, its goodwill, and its repentances. 
Some persons pretend to know better than ourselves what we should say to God, and they set themselves up as our judges. Without being aware of it, says St. Catherine of Siena, we wish to dictate laws to the Holy Spirit and impose our way on other souls. Often our judgment is mistaken and what is worse in the eyes of God. Whatever may be the appearance of the benevolence that we seek to demonstrate, this judgment is evil-minded and comes from our egoism and pride. Instead of seeing our neighbor as a son of God, called to the same beatitude as ourselves, we see in him a rival, whom we want to overturn and abase. We should pay attention and bear our, beat our breasts, because our Lord said, Do not judge, and you will not be judged, because the judgments you give are the judgments you will get. And how can we dare act like judges? Do we wish to take the speck from the eye of our brother while we have a beam in our own? And who can tell us that we might not fall this evening into a much graver offense than what we are condemning? But someone may say, If the evil is evident, does God then ask us to deceive ourselves? St. Catherine of Siena responds, We may not see it to judge it and to murmur, but to have compassion and to assume its weight before God, according to the example of our Lord. This is charity. If we restrain our rash judgment, we will accustom ourselves to seeing our neighbor with the eyes of faith, with a pure eye which is the very eye of God, and we will see in our neighbor the temple of the Holy Spirit, or at least the soul which he wants to reproach and in which he wants to dwell. It is not sufficient, however, to contemplate in the light of faith the supernatural being of our neighbor. We must also love him, bear with him, make ourselves useful, and desire a union of our hearts. First of all, it is necessary to bear the defects of our neighbor. What afflicts the saints to a great degree are the offenses made to God, while what afflicts us more and makes us lose our patience are external defects, which often are a small thing in the eyes of God. We endure some sinners without any difficulty, while certain virtuous persons make us exercise an enormous patience. God wills that we bear with one another in charity. Bear with one another charitably. He does not want us to be scandalized or irritated with the evil he permits. He does not want our zeal to be transformed into patience or bitterness. And he does not want us to complain about others coming to the point of being persuaded that the ideal is in us, or at least that we love it while others do not. In short, he does not want us to pray the prayer of the Pharisee. We should bear with one another without being scandalized by the evil that God permits in order to draw a greater good out of it. The, off, the art of God consists in drawing good from evil. It is precisely the scandal of evil that is made partially sterile so that many attempted efforts to carry out reforms in the church and in religious orders. We should support one another. Indeed, we should do so, something more. As St. Paul says, you should carry each other's troubles, just as our Lord carried the burdens of us all on his shoulders. Perfection, however, does not consist only of bearing with one another, but also in returning good for evil. For all else, we must not we must give good example which edifies, and we must pray. When we are tempted to judge our neighbor severely, to be scandalized or irritated, we should pray, and light will shine in us and in the soul for whom we are praying. We will draw the blessing of God upon him. We should also pray for all the members of the community and for our superiors. Finally, we should place ourselves at the service of all with humility and discretion. Then, with the aid of prayer, the union of hearts as well as the desire of our Lord will be realized. They that may be one as we are one. In the first centuries, this union characterized the life of the church in the world. An intimate union existed between the Hebrew convert, the Greek, and the Roman, between the ignorant and the wise, between the rich and the poor. All formed one single family, that of the sons of God, and earthly goods were held in common. The disciples of Christ were truly recognized by the sign that he himself had given them. The pagans were forced to exclaim, Look how they love one another. With the propagation of the church into the whole world, this profound union and intimate communion could no longer be maintained in the measure of earlier times. God wished, however, that such an example be preserved in the midst of men. This is one of the reasons for the institution of monasteries. Unity forms the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of a monastery. A disunited community is a living lie, according to the sayings of St. John. Anyone who says, I love God and hates his brother, is a liar. In a monastery, all is in common to manifest externally the union of hearts. The same dwelling, the same habit, the same rule, the same food, the same prayer, and the same church. And above all, the same communion at the sacred table, where all are nourished by the same body of Christ. But if the souls are not united, all is a lie before God, before men to whom they are proposed as an example, and also before themselves. A disunited community is sterile, and it wounds the heart of God, who takes away his blessings." 
If, on the other hand, with silence and abnegation, the spirit of faith and charity, all the hearts are united, then all the souls are truly like the members of one same body. Each acts for all, and all act for each. There is only one life, only one soul. It is no exaggeration to say only one soul, because the Holy Spirit, who vivifies all these souls, really inspires them and makes them act. Not in vain did our Lord say that they may be one as we are one. The Father and the Son are one through unity of nature, and of thought, and of love. All their activity has its termination in their common and reciprocal love, in the Holy Spirit. So, too, in a fervent and united community. The souls ought to be entirely one through the unity of supernatural life, thought, and love. Their bond ought to be the same one that unites Father and Son, the common spirit that animates all of them. O soul of the mystical body who vivifies the humanity of Christ, the head and every one of his members, reveal to us the profound life and unity of this body that is glorious in heaven, suffers in purgatory, and struggles here below. Make us understand that even now we belong to the family of the saints and the family of God, and despite the diversity of character, have us love one another as Christ loved us. Amen. And that was a teaching on fraternal charity. Something we should remember and take to heart in these times of crisis in the church. Though one has to wonder, the evils we see in the church now are so blatant and so in your face, but it does wonder what makes you wonder, what are the limits of this charity? For fraternal charity can be used and can be misused by the truly wicked to lead souls to perdition. We know this. Our Lord called out evil as well. Of course, he is God. But the saints did too. So did the, the apostles and the other disciples that we see in the book of Acts. They called out evil. And they were willing to lay their life down to resist such evil. It's an interesting sort of balance we have to strike. But what is balance in this? People think balance means both things held in equal measure, but that's not necessarily what balance means. Where do we err? Where do we err in a time where evil in the church, parading as members of the body of church, of parading as shepherds and as bishops and maybe higher than that, are not hiding their evil anymore? That it's open and in people's faces. What are the limits? How do we handle this? Let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. It's something to consider, to take very seriously. And hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.